the narco culture of the Sinaloa is uh, courageous. And describe, if you would, some of the resistance or concerns you experienced filming Kingdom of Shadows. Um, you know, I think, well, first of all, you know, we wanted to, what I wanted to do was tell a story about the drug war that, you know, we, we haven't seen in other places. There's a lot of media right now about the, you know, drug war, whether it's Narcos on Netflix or Sicario and there are other documentaries. But one thing that I really hadn't seen when I started this film was the kind of the human piece of, of the story. And that's why I wanted to make a film that, that centered on, on three lives that have been impacted by this conflict. Um, and to kind of look at the harm that this, you know, this international drug trade and, and our, you know, different fights against it have caused. So, um, you know, that led me to, to Oscar, to Agent uh, Hagelseeb, um, as one of the voices. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he has an incredibly fascinating, compelling mm -hmm. personal story. And the fact that I, we could narrate a piece of the drug war's history through his personal story made it, made it really appealing. It made, made me want to include him in the film. Mm -hmm. Oscar, I agree. Gotta ask, with your job, throughout that journey, how do you not take your work home with you? Because that's something that I don't think anyone can humanly just shake off at the end of the day. Uh, actually, it's very hard. It's very hard to not take the work home. Um, <clears throat> the majority of the time that I was doing undercover work, I was single and I didn't have uh, children. And that was for a specific reason. It's real hard to. Be doing an undercover deal with your when you're when you're negotiating multi-million dollar deals, mm -hmm. and you're portraying yourself to be, you know, this narco that has all this money yeah. and it's it's, a, it's all a fantasy. But you don't. I mean, your 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 brain doesn't realize that. And so you're living this life like you're this big, you know, badass drug trafficker that is dealing with another drug trafficker, and then at the end of the deal, then you go home. And your significant other, your wife, is getting mad at you because you left the socks laying in the, you know? <laughs> and, and to your brain, you're thinking, like, do you know who I am? You know? So it, it, it's very hard to, to maintain a, 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 a relationship working on recovery. There's, there, was a, there was a study that was done that, you know, in the general population, uh, divorce rate is, what, 50, you know, 50-50, might be a little higher. Law enforcement is a little bit higher, about 70% of, of law enforcement marriages end in, in divorce. In undercover work, if you're working specifically undercover, it's much, much higher. It's like a 90% divorce rate. So it's very, very, very hard to not take your work. Uh, that's basically <laughs> basic magic. There's a scene in, in the documentary where you actually are putting yourself out there mm -hmm. so people can see who you are. That really touched me because mm -hmm. that's still so dangerous. But you're doing that, and, and you actually say in the film the reason that you're doing it. Would you? Yeah, I mean, it, it's uh, it's very simple in, in the sense that, uh, like I said, to me it was it was everyday work. You know, it was it was you know like talking a day in the office, doing the deal in the morning, one in the afternoon, but at night, and you know, the, the individuals that I dealt with, you know, I don't I don't remember every individual that I dealt with. I might I might remember, might remember the the main guy. But you know, they all have bodyguards, they all have individuals that are associated with them. So a lot of the times that we did an undercover deal, the case, the case never went to trial because you know, they would plead guilty uh, without having to go you know, to try to get some sort of leniency. So all this time, you know, like I said, to me it was just another day at, at, at the office. To that individual, it's a life-changing event. It's an event where that led them to be in prison for 10, 15 years. So they have all this time to wonder like, well, was a guy with the tattoos, that was a guy that was probably a snitch, you know. And it's happened to me where I'm, you know, I could be with my family in El Paso, and I see somebody looking at me, and I'm thinking like, man, where do I know this guy from? Mm -hmm. And they'll actually come up to me and say like, hey, you know, uh, Oscar, do you remember me? And and I'm, you know, that's the undercover name that I use, it's Oscar, I never changed oh, my name, wow. it's Oscar. Wow. Yeah. Not my last name, I changed my last name, but I always used Oscar. And so I'm like, no, and he goes, yeah, I mean, we did that deal, and I got, I got pinched, or I got arrested, and they try to get a little bit, you know, and I've had to, I've had to actually badge him and say, hey, look, I don't know who you think you are, but, you know. And so, so to me, it's just a, a sense of, of, uh, of security. That's not to say they won't come after you because you're a federal agent, but they're, they're less than likely because they know the consequences of doing it. Mm -hmm. See? Sí. 
se va a dar a conocer y todo, ¿ustedes sienten el, el temor de, de todo lo que ustedes están exponiendo ahí? Que es increíble y los felicito a los dos por el trabajo que ponen su vida para mostrar algo tan real y tan triste como es todo esto. Que ¿Ustedes cómo sienten el temor ahora? Porque ahora va público todo, va a ser entrevistas, van a tener cómo se sienten de, de todo lo que han reflejado aquí en esta... Y que es verdad, que son... Pues siempre hay riesgo en contar, narrar este, este tipo de, este clase de películas, pero yo diría que a final de cuentas las personas que realmente están, bueno, arriesgando sus vidas son personas como Ask Oscar, que ha dedicado su carrera a hacer este tipo de trabajo, y personas como la hermana Consuelo, que vemos en la película, ¿no? Que día tras día está empujando el gobierno estatal de Nuevo León a, a que hagan algo con con estos casos de desaparecidos, desaparecidos. Entonces, yo creo que realmente los que merecen este apoyo y atención internacional son con personas como Mara Consuelo, ¿no? defensores sí. de derechos humanos que están trabajando en un contexto muy difícil y sumamente peligroso. Y este realmente ahí es, es el valor donde, o sea, esas personas realmente están en el en peligro. Y como... sí. Mucha gente pues me dice como usted me está expresando de que qué peligroso que trabajaste en cubierto y que te estás sí. exponiendo, pero pues, yo, yo tengo el respaldo del de, de, de gobierno, ¿verdad? yo soy agente federal, entonces a mí la, la persona que se me hace, me hace peligroso, que se me hace, que tiene mucho valor, mucho, a lot of courage, es, es la hermana Consuelo, porque yo, yo me puedo defender ¿verdad? de una manera u otra, todavía tengo, tengo defensa, estoy en los Estados Unidos, este, la, la hermana Consuelo, ella le está apuntando el dedo a los carteles y, les, y al gobierno está diciendo ustedes son los que tienen la culpa, ustedes tienen que hacer algo y como he dicho uh, me, me dudo que la, la iglesia católica le, le autorice un, un equipo de seguridad, unos escoltas Porque, y, pero ella en realidad lo necesita y no he tenido el placer de conocerla pero la quiero conocer porque eso es valor eso es tener es, eso es, es, es tener uh, valores morales de que, que que desafían cualquier clase de peligro y temor. ¿Y México cómo va a tomar la película? Yo, yo creo que México está pasando un momento obviamente difícil en el campo de derechos humanos. Desgraciadamente no hay nada nuevo en, el, en las historias de los desaparecidos. Yo creo que el público mexicano ya sabe más de lo que está sucediendo. Pero lo que sí siento que puede ser algo nuevo para un público mexicano son las historias de Oscar y de Don Henry Ford, que es el ex traficante, ¿no? Eso sí representan narrativas que no, no hemos visto mucho en, en México, ¿no? Entonces, a final de cuentas, la película sí es como un diálogo entre México y Estados Unidos, ¿no? Es un, una conversación necesaria. Which, do you, no, did you want me to do my part? Or any any no, 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 said. Uh, okay, I'll ask the question that she okay. had. Now that you're, the film is coming out, right. and more people are going to know who Oscar is, and, right. and the sister, and uh, do you think that their lives are going to be more in danger, or, or, or also it's going to be more knowledge of what's going on? Because the film, most of it was done in Monterrey, That's right. which most people only think of places like Juarez and places exactly. like that. Uh, so uh, what do you guys say? Uh, I mean, from, you know, I, I think that every film carries, once a film becomes public, there's always the risk of putting people in additional danger. Sometimes the attention can be helpful. Um, the last film that I made before this is a film called Reportero, or The Reporter, which is about a group of journalists in, in Tijuana covering organized crime and political corruption. And in that case, the film kind of gave them some necessary attention to be able to do their work in a slightly safer context. Not, no, no one's going to say that, they're, you know, that they've got complete security because of the attention, but I do think that there's a need for kind of, uh, you, know, you, you know this as journalists, that more attention you give to a subject the greater awareness there is and hopefully a kind of a more sophisticated dialogue can emerge from that, right? So, um, you know, Oscar made a very clear decision to participate in the film because he felt like it was necessary to tell his, his story and he can, he can speak to that. But, um, you know, my goal in the film is really to, 
have a conversation, a, a more sophisticated conversation between the U.S. And, and Mexico. There's a lot of hype. There's a lot of kind of hyperbole when it comes to the U.S. and Mexico. And what I wanted to do is just bring it down to a human scale and have three people talk about their lives and how they've been impacted by the drug war. <coughs> uh, I, I, I decided to, to do this film in part because, you know, working, did, did I mention that or is, did I mention the undercover part in yeah. English? No, okay. not in English. Okay. The, the reason being was that, I, I forget, I'm sorry, I'm doing so many interviews. Uh, you know, to, to me, working, working, working undercover was, was, uh, was like an everyday work mm -hmm. job for me. See what he said. Yeah, I did, I'm right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, did. So I don't know, yeah. I think, what, what question did you ask in Spanish? I, th I think she's, she's, she's asking that, you know, if I'm afraid now that I've exposed yeah. myself. Uh, you know, I think that you know, you, you, a lot of the times when when people ask a question about me, they say you're brave, you know, mm -hmm. to be doing this. And mm -hmm. what I mentioned to her is that I think that bra braveness and being brave is defined by Sister Consuelo. I'm, I'm a federal agent. You know, I, I I know, you know, I know what I got into, and I know, you know, I've been trained to a certain extent on how to defend myself. I know how to take, you know, you know, know if some, there's a threat against me, what steps I need to take, and I'm I'm somehow protected by the government in mm -hmm. the sense that I'm representing the government. So, you know, the cartels are literally likely to come come after me. Right. Sister Consuelo, on the other hand, I mean, she's she's pointing the finger at the cartel saying you guys are responsible, you know, or not only the cartels, but the, the government. And uh, she doesn't have any sort of protection. Like I mentioned to her, I doubt the Roman Catholic Church is gonna authorize a security detour, <laughs> yeah. even though she's the one that needs it. Right. To me, I haven't had the pleasure of meeting her, but, you know, when I do, if I ever have the chance, I, I want to express to her how much I admire that that she's she's doing this mm -hmm. without any sort of protection. Mm -hmm. And she's doing it for lack of better terms in enemy enemy territory. Yeah. You know, without protection. Mm -hmm. You know, there's been uh, between Monterey and Ho uh, Juarez there's probably annually more people die than through the entire Vietnam conflict. And w short of legalization of drugs uh, I mean, total legalization, where there's some sort of, you know, free trade going on. That's not going to end. Um, mm -hmm. What do you? I mean, just what do you think is? I mean, what's your opinion on, on, uh, on, changing the system, or how do you see it? And especially, Oscar, what do you think as a as a federal officer? What are, our, what are the options? Uh, I think that we're we're, we're fooling ourselves as a society thinking that. You said short of, of drugs being legal, mm -hmm. having some sort of, 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 of trade, because once something becomes legal, it's not going to be lucrative for the cartels. Mm -hmm. So they're going to they're going to seek other other uh, ways of, of generating that that revenue. The cartels haven't you know didn't just come come up in in the 80s or or in the 90s. The cartels have been established since the 20s during the prohibition era. Mm -hmm. They weren't called cartels, but that's what you know. What became of the cartels now it started back in the 20s, where they were smuggling, you know, alcohol into the United States because it was something that was illegal. Mm -hmm. It was something that the Americans wanted, and it was a way for them to generate funds. What happens when prohibition ends? That's when you start seeing the the, the smuggling of, of of opium, of marijuana, of anything that's lucrative. So you know, the legalization of of, of drugs is not is not the answer. Furthermore, there's a there's a big push right now for the legalization of marijuana, mm -hmm. and I think there's people have this fantasy that once you do that, it eliminates the revenue from the cartels, and that they're going to cease to exist because it's not lucrative for them to smuggle marijuana. They know that the cartels know that this is happening, and so you're seeing a concentrated effort by the cartels right now to push other drugs. Mm -hmm. you're, we're seeing an epidemic of heroin. Of, of, of heroin overdoses, of mm -hmm. methamphetamine, of kids actually experimenting with methamphetamine and getting addicted to methamphetamine. Uh -huh. And the problem here is that we all know that methamphetamine is more destructive to your to your health mm -hmm. than than marijuana. Mm -hmm. And to, just to simplify, uh, every time I've encountered somebody that's high on marijuana and, and I'm going to arrest them, for the most part, they're like, all right, take me to jail, I'm hungry, you know? <laughs> Seriously, but when I've encountered somebody that's high on cocaine, right. on meth, or or, 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 or something, you're, you're, you're ready for a fight. Mm -hmm. So think of it, you're, I'm simplifying it, but think mm -hmm. of it as, as a, in a larger scale. Mm -hmm. Think that society needs to be ready 
to realize that okay, you're going to legalize marijuana, but you're going to have a whole social economic issue in in the back end because these people are going to be addictive, they're going to be more more prone to violence, and we have to take care of them as a society. Their mm-hmm. health issues, their 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 uh, you know their addictive. Try to fight mm-hmm. fight that. So you know you got to be ready for that. Society's got to be ready for that. Do you see that the change, though, in Monterey and Juarez? Do you think that a legalization of marijuana would stop any of the any of the the current problems that are the current uh, the the disappearances, the deaths? These people haven't just disappeared; they're dead somewhere. Mm-hmm. If you haven't, I mean, they're not in a prisoner of war camp somewhere. Right. I feel. Well, you know, I think I mean one of the things that the film does is that it includes this range of perspectives. It's really important to have the perspective of a law enforcement mm-hmm. person who has dealt with it mm-hmm. in a direct way. But you know, we also have other perspectives in in the uh, in the film. You know, the perspective of a former smuggler and a human rights defender, just just to show how complex this whole s- scenario is. And you know, I I think that. From my perspective and what I, I've seen studying, you know, the U.S.-Mexico narco conflict over the last few years, it's it's kind of like a perfect storm of forces. It's this high demand in the United States, mm-hmm. but it's also a kind of uh, weak mm-hmm. rule of law and mm-hmm. a lack of human rights in, in Mexico, and also serious poverty and inequality right. that kind of feeds all these kind of foot soldiers into the drug trade. And so you really have this perfect storm of forces that have it's like you know dousing fuel on a on a fire. Mm-hmm. It's it's made it. Um, extreme pockets of the country are extremely dangerous and in the control of organized crime groups. At the same time, there are some changes happening. Um, Monterrey is, has gone through a, a, a safer period. Um, you know, there, there, there are pockets of the country that are safer than they used to be. Although, you know, this, the, this, this human rights uh, question is, you know, remains a very, very big issue in Mexico. 26,000, now that number's gone up since we made the film, 26,000 according to the latest official figures from the Mexican government. Of course, many people believe that number to be much higher, but mm-hmm. these are people who are unaccounted for. Right. Um, the you know the most emblematic case was the case of the 43 students who were mm-hmm. abducted and subsequently disappeared a little over a year ago. Mm-hmm. There have been mass demonstrations all over Mexico. You know that really points to a kind of rule of law question, um, and the, the big issue being corruption. I mean, I think that's really mm-hmm. the the big issue. I would just add one one thing is something that we talk about a lot. Um, is that you know he, something he, I, can't, I can't ever get him to tell me that the, you know spill the beans on. But the criminal distribution networks within the United States mm-hmm. are really kind of key part of this, and we don't really talk about it in the U.S. media. Um, you know where narco dollars are banked, mm-hmm. uh, what the what the routes are, what the supply chain routes are throughout the United States and these big big hubs. Obviously, mm-hmm. these you know illicit narcotics aren't just vanishing when they hit the U.S. Mexico mm-hmm. border. They're going somewhere, mm-hmm. and so who's you know who's doing the reporting on that, where they're going, and and uh, how those profits are being filtered back to organized crime groups in Mexico. You know that's a big that's a big film mm-hmm. or you know a big study of some kind. Definitely. Yeah. I was going to say there's there's a line from Mr. Ford that was saying that people misunderstand what the the dynamics between Mexico and Texas mm-hmm. specifically right. that were intertwined yeah. no matter what we we do or say anywhere right. else in the country and I found that quite yeah. uh, quite interesting. Well, I think that you know you look at Oscar's history. I mean, he, he's a, he's part of the the history of the U.S. Mexico border of Texas and Mexico and. You know, I think when you get beyond the hype and you just look at the facts on the ground, the you know, destinies of the two countries are linked, whether you like it or not. You know, um, Mexico is the second or third largest trading partner of the United States. There are deep demographic, cultural, and you know, economic ties between the two countries. So, uh, this conflict is just a—it's a product of that relationship. Um, sometimes Mexico being the producer to U.S. demand, you know, sometimes receiving the kind of. Um, the most damaging part of that relationship as well when it comes to human rights. Well, while you were sure this, I, I was getting curious because we talk about the corruption in the police department down in Mexico. And mm-hmm. I mean, were, did you come across any, you know, like specific police or someone saying to you, why are you doing this? Why are you? Mm-hmm. you know? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I, I uh, try to be, I work in a very small team. We don't have private security. We don't do any of that. I've never done that. Um, I, other filmmakers who touch on the subject do work with security firms. And uh, I just never, I like to have a small footprint. 
and I'm very straightforward with people about what I'm doing. I mean, I approached the Fuerza Civil, which is the new police force in Monterrey, very straightforward with them about what I wanted to do. Um, you know, I, I do think that there are people who looked at what we were doing very suspiciously and, and were, were concerned, of course. Um, thankfully, we were not threatened directly and there, there, there wasn't anything like that. I mean, look, at the end of the day, I can always, I always have the option of, of leaving Mexico if, if things, get, things get bad. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but it's not like U.S. citizens haven't been um, attacked. I mean, the ICE agent Jaime Zapata was uh, shot and killed on a highway in northern mm -hmm. Mexico. I mean, it's that there's a kind of, I would say there's a new rules of engagement now, right? It's mm -hmm. not like what it used to be. Yeah, I mean, for the, for the longest time, the cartels operated in an unwritten rule that, you know, mm -hmm. you, don't, you, know you, don't, you don't go after, you know, people that are not actively involved with the cartels. You don't go, definitely don't go after U.S. Uh, interest or, 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 or consulates or agents. Mm -hmm. uh, just for the simple fact that it's not good for business. You know, they realize that if they do something against, you know, one of the agents, you know, uh, the United States is going to put the full force of, 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 their, of their strength right. into determining who did it. The, the danger in, in, in what, what, what really what led to all this violence is the fact that the setas were, in, and that, I attribute That's that, it. the setas were introduced into, into the drug game, which they, they don't have the, the legacy, they don't have the, 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 like I mentioned before, the cartels were established, as, as we said, were established in the 20s. So they, they have a, a, a legacy of, of, uh, of a code, right? Uh -huh. And so, so those, those unwritten rules were passed down by, by, by grandfather to father to That's son. Done you know, the, the, the written rules. Uh, the setas, on the other hand, you know, these guys recruit uh, individuals that, you know, only a few months before they left, they left for the military were, were farm workers in Oaxaca, mm -hmm. you know, earning maybe $2 a week if they're lucky. And now they get into the military, they, they gain uh, a specific skill set that is attractive to the setas because they know the simple, even simple as, as the, the, the chain of command. You know, they understand that. They don't have to train them how to use weapons because of military training. Yeah? And now these individuals are earning, you know, fifty dollars a week or, or, or hundred dollars a week, and they have, you know, brand new trucks and they have weapons, unlimited drugs. They don't remember and they don't care uh, what happened with, mm -hmm. you know, when Kiki Camarena was was shot and killed. They don't follow those rules. They're military. If you hit him, if you're trying to hurt him, what does the military train you to do? You hurt him back. Mm -hmm. You don't retreat. And so that's where a lot of the violence spiked up. It was a sense that the setas came into the fold, and you know, it, 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 it's, it really changed the way that the game is played. I was going to say, I really like the way you were introduced in the movie, Oscar. Mm -hmm. We see you riding on your motorcycle, then you're revealed to be you know, a drug enforcement officer. Mm -hmm. And I was just curious, was that your idea, or was that the director's idea? I mean, it's just honestly, it's just a reflection of how I met Oscar for the first time as well. I, um, two, we had two great journalists who collaborated on the films, Alfredo Corchalo and uh, Angela Cocherga. Alfredo was the is the Dallas uh, Morning uh, News' uh, Mexico bureau chief, and they they kind of played a trick on me. They I told them that I was really I was looking for law enforcement characters, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and they said, you know, we, we think we have somebody who will be perfect for you. Um, he's a you know high ranking homeland security investigator. He's a federal agent. Come down to El Paso and meet him. So I flew to El Paso, and I was waiting in a cafe waiting to to meet, uh, you know, Oscar. And I had this preconception of what a federal agent was supposed to look like mm -hmm. as well. And so this guy came in, and he wasn't wearing a suit. You know, he had, he's got tats all up and down his <laughs> arms, and he's wearing a baseball cap and had a chain. And so I saw him walk past me, but I, it didn't even occur to me that that man might be a federal agent. It's only until a few minutes later where I felt a tap on my shoulder, <laughs> and I realized that that was Oscar Hagelsey, that he was a federal agent. So I just wanted the audience to have the same experience that I'd had in meeting him, which is to... You know, to kind of question your assumptions about stereotypes and who's what. You know, I mean, that that happens throughout the film, and that was obviously a conscious choice. You, have, you know, Don Henry Ford, who could be a John Wayne kind of classic, you know, cowboy figure, is in fact a smuggler. Um, Oscar, who many people in this country would assume is a, you know, a gangbanger or a, you know, a, a drug dealer, is in fact a high-ranking federal agent. And even Sister Consuelo, who's a, you know, diminutive. Catholic nun who people probably, you know, on the surface think, oh, she's this quiet, nice lady. She's in fact, you know, pushing against a, a kind of 
system of corruption and um, you know that, that's generating human rights abuses. So the, the whole film wanted you know I wanted to play with that idea of things aren't always what they seem in the drug war. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, it was very <laughs> there's that phrase uh, shining a light into that darkness. And with your dealings and uh, interview with Sister Fitzgerald, what 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 do you think motivates her? Because it's a fight that everybody knows right. it, it never ends. So just from your experience, spend time there. Um, you know, it was very difficult to get access to her personal life. She's a very, she's very weary in some ways of having a camera, like everybody in the film. And over time, you kind of develop a relationship with people. Um, you see it in the film, though. It's it's really her faith. Um, you know, I'm not a, a religious person, but when I was very struck by her her faith. It's a very genuine kind of uh, profound faith. And there's, I start the film with her praying, and we end with mm -hmm. her praying. In part because it's that's really what drives her um, her work. It's this belief that she has to do something for 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 families and for society in general. She's a very stubborn person, um, and I think a big part of that is driven by faith. There's a great a, a journalist friend has a great line about her, and he says that Sister Consuelo is a combination of tenderness and fury. Yeah, she's that great combination of kind of. Así es, sigue, sigue trabajando en Monterrey y de hecho la embajadora este, um, de, a, a las Naciones Unidas, este, acaba, Samantha Power, acaba de ir a Monterrey a visitarla hace como tres o cuatro días. Yeah, I was just saying that the uh, Ambassador Power to the UN just went and visited uh, Sister Consuelo en Monterrey. Mm -hmm. uh, what, you know, the, there's I think a beginning recognition of her human rights work mm -hmm. in Mexico. Yeah, it's, it's amazing, and she's yeah, very brave. In a perfect world, in a perfect world, what would you expect from the film? What would you expect the film, or what would you hope in a perfect world that the film will do both of you? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, for me, it's already been more than I kind of could hope for with a film because of you know why by, by certainly by Hollywood standards or by any kind of other measure. Just a two-minute warning. Okay. Um, you know th these are this is a very small film. This is a very kind of small budgeted film. We, it's amazing to be able to work with participant, but it's a you know very small smaller film for them. You know small in, in the world. So just the fact that we're going to have this. Binational distribution. We have a great distributor in Mexico. We're going to have you know in every digital outlet on November twentieth. The fact that it's getting out there, and then afterwards it'll be on PBS in twenty sixteen as part of the documentary series POV. Um, the fact that there's such an interest in it is, to me, is 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 really exciting. Precisely because there's so much media out there about this topic. A lot of it sensationalizes. You know, a lot of it fictionalizes. Uh, some of it kind of doesn't want to look into the historical roots or what, mm -hmm. what people mm -hmm. have faced. And so I'm very pleased that um, there's people have embraced this film, you know, as complex as it is. It's not an easy film. It's three different stories. There's mm -hmm. kind of a history lesson in there. And it's forcing you to look at this human rights issue that's mm -hmm. not, it's not an easy thing to, to kind of digest. But um, I'm, I'm just pleased that it's going to go out into the world and it's having such a, a strong life. That, you know, that to me is, is really powerful. Mm -hmm. To me, to me uh, it, just, uh, it, it just helps to, uh, uh, first of all, honor my father. Uh, uh, he just passed away. Uh, and also, it, I wanted to highlight the, the work that a lot of federal agents do you know, in the shadows. Mm -hmm. That people don't realize that, you know, like like uh, Bernardo says, it, it's breaking stereotype. But I think that once you look at me, and 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 you realize that you know not everybody fits in that little box. You know the, the person that you that, you know that you look at that you might think is you know the worst of the world is actually an individual that's risking their lives mm -hmm. to to protect you. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, that this film is is going to do that, and 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 it has done it. And I'm, mm -hmm. I'm very honored to be able to to participate in it. Mm -hmm. I, I think as simple as it was, the the ending you know, mm -hmm. montage mm -hmm. was really powerful. Just sitting there and watching you know, mm -hmm. actually made me feel kind of hopeless. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, when, when you see the crowds were, were yeah. scream, I mean, it's total silence. Yeah. You know, it's ah, just yes. people people crying, mm -hmm. and, and it's just it's very touching. It, it is very touching. touching.
There's a lot more specific examples of just how crazy the drug war has been, and it's yes. becoming more and more impaired in movies like this, or maybe even Sabotage or Sicario, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or even Breaking Bad to a certain extent. Sure. I mean, with it sort of per getting more into the media, how insane the drug war has become, do you think that's having an effect on it at all? You mean a film like this, this having, kind mm -hmm. of pushing back? Yeah. You know, I think in a in a, a one way, I think it's good that there are more films out there because maybe we can start getting past some of those stereotypes and having a kind of more complex dialogue. Yeah. You know, this is a kind of this is I think this is kind of like a slow burn film. It's um, it's picked up a lot of steam already, and as people talk about it, and one thing I think that documentary does is that you know these are all these are the, the you know lived experiences of real people. You know, they're not mm -hmm. fictional characters. And what I love about documentary is that sometimes, you know, these, these truthful stories are wilder than any Hollywood, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, Oscar's story could clearly be an HBO series or a multi-part <laughs> series, you know. Yeah. Don Ford has, you know, um, you know, as an extraordinary set of circumstances, all the characters do. I just love that that kind of, in real journalism and real documentary, sometimes the stories, you know, pack a bigger punch, you know. If you're, if you're patient and you, can, and you can stick with it, you know, um, mm -hmm. they can pack a punch.